Hello. My name's Stannis. I'm here to talk to you today about the importance of older people, about the importance of their own dignity. And I wanted to start off with this poem that was written by an older woman. We don't know who, but I think it really conveys to me some of the messages that I want to leave with you. So my children are coming today. They mean well, but they worry. They think I should have a railing in the hall, a telephone in the kitchen. My mother had a telephone in the bathroom because we wanted one there for her. They want someone to come in when I take a bath. They don't really want me living alone. Help me to be grateful for their concern and help them to understand that I have to do what I can. They're right when they say that there are risks. I might fall, I might leave the stove on, but there is no risk, no possibility of triumph, no real aliveness without risk. When they were young and they climbed trees and they rode bicycles and they went away to camp, I was terrified, but I let them go because to hold on to them would have hurt them. Now our roles are reversed. Help them to see. Keep me from being grim or stubborn about it, but don't let them smother me. So what should we do about mom? Maybe we should ask her. Maybe mom has something to say about that. Now I want to be upfront. My whole area of research is on caregiving. I have met, I've talked to, many, many caregivers who are genuinely concerned about the person that they're caring for. I've been a caregiver myself. It's tough, tough work. So while I say, please take into account the dignity of the older person, don't get me wrong, I truly believe that there's a really big job for those caregivers and that they themselves need support. So I'm talking about people who are fretting. They're fretting because their parents are getting older. Maybe some of you in the room, your parents are getting older. We all have parents. Guess what? They get older. So do we, by the way. But what I'm talking about is our whole society that looks at those older people as objects. Even the words we use, placement in a long-term care facility. Let's place her. I'm here to help find out what is the best placement option for you. I had a friend, my mom has just recently passed away, and a friend talked to me about three or four years ago, and she said, when are you going to put your mother in a nursing home? Put her in a home. Wow. I said, maybe I'll talk to her first. I don't, she's got other plans, and she did. So perhaps you've heard this is important because our population is aging. Now, that's no big surprise to you, I'm sure, and that's because one particular reason, we're living longer. So in the early 1900s, in fact, men lived to 59 years of age on average and women 61. By 2009, women, are living to 83 and men to 79. That's quite a significant change, and it's a good thing for the most part. Let me point out one thing about this, though. In the middle, there was a, a much larger gap. So I just want to point that out to you. In fact, the gap between women and men in terms of their life expectancy is actually narrowing. Why is that? I think it's because we women went to work, we started to drink, smoke, all those good things. So now we're not living as long, or at least the, the, we are living longer, but not, uh, our gap is narrowing to men. Why is that important to you? Well, let's think of it this way. Think of your own parents, because many of you are at university. When my grandmother was living, her age group knew their mother for 22 years. My mother, her age group, knew their mother for 33 years. Me, my age group, knows their mother, the baby boomers, around 44 years. You, university students born in the early 1990s, you're going to know your mother for 53 years. So, on average, if you're not getting along with her right now, 
You've got time. You've got time. But think about it. It's very important. Some of the work that I do is looking to the future. So what are we going to do? Now, we've all heard of those baby boomers. They've been born in 1946 to 1964. In fact, the last bo baby boomer will turn 50 next year. So they are aging, and they're going to increase the number of people over the age of 65. But what is 65 anyway? It's a, a, a point in time when we say, after which you're old. Guess what? Not really. And so this, uh, some of the work that we've done is not only look to project how many older people there will be, but project the needs that they will have. And so the important piece of this bar is actually to show you the gray or the black. Those are the people who don't need help who are over the age of 65. Do you notice something? It's most of the people over 65. In fact, most of the people over 65 are actually helping other people also over 65, some of whom might be their parents. Novel thought. Think about it. So what are we going to do then um, in the future? What are we going to do when baby boomers get older and need care? Well, let me just give you a quick illustration from my own life. I'm from a family of baby boomers. My whole family actually is almost the exact cohort of the baby boomers. My mother, who died in July, had nine children, 23 grandchildren, and 25 grandchildren, and 15 great-great-grandchildren. This is my mother in the middle. Last year at the hockey game we have annually at Christmas time, this is not all her descendants, only the ones that play hockey. <laughs> and as you can see, the people who are Toronto Maple Leaf fans, they don't wear their shirt because there's a lot of Montreal Canadian fans <laughs> in our family. The thing is, when my mother needed help, and she lived in her own home, by herself, with dementia, for many years, she had seven children who near lived nearby Fortunately, there's seven days in the week, one for every day. Worked in our family. What's going to happen in the future? Do you know in the future, by 2051, the proportion of women over 65 who have a surviving child is about 70%. It's going to go down, so there's going to be about 30% of women over the age of 65 with no surviving children. My mother had nine. Some people will have none. And then there's the ones, those baby boomers, who in fact had only one child. Guess what? I'm one of them. And so here's, in contrast to the previous slide and the support system that my mother has, my mother's no longer with us, and so I have one descendant. Now I have to tell you, when he was two, we did buy him a kitchen set so that he would be able to care for me as I got older. He's still a little concerned, though, because as he said to me a couple of years ago, Mom, you know, Grammy has nine children, and like, I'm only one. And I said, don't worry, dear. You know, I'll try to put money aside. All you'll have to do is visit me. He said, so when can I put you in that nursing home? I said, not yet. <laughs> don't, don't, don't mess with me. But it's important that we think about the future important that we think about talking to our family about some of these issues. Women who turn 50 today will live on average to be 92. Now when I went to my bank a few weeks ago, a few months ago actually, and I talked to them about my retirement plan, even though I'm only 50, I thought I better start thinking about this. They said, oh, don't worry, don't worry. We have you projected, you'll be fine. We have you projected. I said, well, what's the average, uh, you know, date of death you have there for me. 85. I said, oh, great. Just when I really need help, the money will run out. You guys need to think about this. So we need to plan for the future, and we need to talk to our parents and to our children and talk about uh, what they want starting early on in, in their 50s and 60s and continuing the conversation. It's not just a one-time deal. And we need, truly, to be able to support people to live as long as they can 
in the place where they most desire to live. And that's not just us as children and as family, but it's also our government. We know that in the future, we're going to have fewer availability of family. So who's going to care for those individuals who have no children or whose child lives in another part of the world? We need to be thinking about policies and supports for the caregivers that are currently involved, but also for those caregivers, for those individuals who do not have caregivers and how they will need to have support provided to them. I'll just leave you with this slide because I think it's important that we think about how much care is actually given. And this is, again, some of our research that talked about for people who need assistance, how many hours of care of support do they get? We're only talking about people who live in the community, not people in the hospital or in the nursing home, whatever, just people who are living in their own homes. And in 2006, there was 15 million hours of care a week being provided to older Canadians. 15 million hours a week. By 2031, that's going to double almost to 29 million hours a week. And what's important is that the proportion, while still is going to be primarily the family, which is the um, yellow bars, there's an increasing proportion that will be needed to be provided by formal services. And here's where innovation comes in. Because we need to think outside the box. Right now, a lot of the innovation that's happening is positive, but it's focused on monitoring. Let's get a camera. Let's put a camera in mom's house so we can see what she's doing. She might fall. She might do whatever. Maybe she'll have a man over. Oh, God, great. What am I going to do about that? Maybe it's none of your business. Think about yourself when you're older. Do you want your child seen when you're dancing around making supper? Or, you know, maybe you're up in the washroom and you decide, oh, yeah, I'll just run down and get my coffee, and you don't put on any clothes because there's nobody at home. And they say, oh my god, she forgot her clothes. She really does have Alzheimer's. Oh, this is terrible. <laughs> this can happen. A lot of the innovation is focused on monitoring. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. What I'm saying is we need to develop some new technologies that take into account the dignity of the older person. That may be uh, help for falling, knowing when someone might fall, sensors on different pads or patterns of getting up in the middle of the night. It may be even moving towards the robot carer system that's happening in Japan. We need innovative solutions to help support the older population in the future. And so I want to leave you with, in addition to focusing on inventing a cure, let us really try our best to think about reinventing care and reinventing care in a way that it continues to respect the dignity of our older population. Thank you. <laughs>